I'm going to shut this door. There. Much better. You have to be the set designer. You got to play the guitar. You're used to it. You're used to taking uh, taking charge of everything. Hey, I'm Brian Hyatt, senior writer with Rolling Stone. And I just spoke with Jimmy Buffett. He talked about everything from his early days in Key West to the memorable day he once spent on Bob Dylan's boat. But he started off talking about his new album, Life on the Flip Side. If you take it chronologically, when we started thinking about doing an album, we haven't done one in, in like seven years. And it was, you know, there were two things about that. I didn't know where the albums would still be, you know, viable by, by then or else you'd be uploading like one or two songs. But we still are a playing band, you know, and we've got a great little studio down in Key West. And my uh, creative side had been working in musical theater with the show on Broadway and then the touring show. So I was working on that a lot, actually rewriting songs and stuff like that, and you know, doing changes and things. So once that was all put to bed, I said, yeah, we need to do an album. And we had some good songs that, that had some ideas. And so I concentrated on writing them. And this is like a year ago. So, and we said, we're gonna, I'm just gonna concentrate on writing these songs, getting some of uh, the go-to people, wingmen that I, and women I use to write with, and, uh, and just concentrate on that. And we want to go to Key West and record. And I want to go to Cuba to shoot the album cover because I got a friend over there, Roberto Salas, who's a photographer. But I thought life on the flip side was referring to the Gulf Stream and having spent so much time in Key West myself and having a, a family history of my, my grandfather who was a sailing ship captain and my dad sailing in and out of Havana Harbor. So that was originally it. And then Life on the flip side, also, I, the tongue-in-cheek was those people that remember, 45s will remember there was a flip side. Those that won't will ask questions. So that was the whole initial thought process. And then along comes the pandemic, and the title kind of fit. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a music in a way, but it never was supposed to be that. But the songs, when they came out, uh, Chris Blackwell is a dear, longtime friend, and, you know, for what he – his input is, is very valuable to me on, on this whole process. When I sent it to him and he played it, he said, yes, yeah, it's got that Jimmy thing going. He said, but in only black by way, he said, but there's a sharpness to it. Mm. <laughs> and I went, yeah, there was a little sharpness to it. He picked it up right away. So now when you hear all the, the whole album together, yeah, it, I think that it, it's doing its thing. You know, when I make a record, I don't make it for me. Once it's done, People can interpret what whatever it is they think I'm saying or whatever, whatever it means to them. To me, that's what a, a collection of songs on an album, because I'm still an album guy and I wanted it to be an album. And I want and I did the sequence myself. And and when you sequence things on a record, I only know one way to do it. And that's like a live show. There's only a few tricks that you do. It's about it's about energy and it's about um, about. Um, you know, recognition. So I got enough songs that people recognize that they can sing along with. So when That's they, sure. before, when you did a new album, you could never put 14 songs out and do a show. They'd walk out. So you always tried to pick the song that would fit into what was working before. So that's the same way when we, we did these songs and we did them in Key West. We, we cut all the tracks in five days in Key West. We were, we were hungry to get in the studio and you know the vibe was going and you just go with it and uh and so when we uh when that happened and i sequenced it i used that energy and there there was no recognition because nobody knew the song so <laughs> but i just wanted it to take that energy like it was a set list and that's that's how i did it. that makes sense how has your songwriting process changed over the years i, I think you, you tend to use collaborators maybe a little bit more since probably, mm -hmm. and for a while now, not, it's not a recent thing, uh, but yeah. Yeah, how has it changed since, say, like the early 70s? Like, uh, what's been the yeah. progression in, in your process? <clears throat> well, it, it's changed in, in the way, in the beginning of anything. Like, I didn't co-write with anybody because I didn't know anybody else, you know? you Nobody really <laughs> was, was around, and nobody, you know, few people were listening. So when I got to Key West, and the very first time, I, when Jerry Jeff Walker drove me down there and I fell in love with Key West and moved there, you know, I'd had like five really bad years in Nashville, but I was still writing. So I came to Key West with a little bit of luggage and a lot of songs. And that environment being in there and then, you know, soaking up the cultural aspect of from from pirate days to the writers to, you know, the the, you know, 
tolerant lifestyle that an island had. You know, there was the Navy, there was a gay community, there were hippies, there were, it just, I, I fell right into it and took those songs there. And I think I soaked up a lot of that when I wrote those songs, which when we did this album, I went back and listened to those first three albums a lot mm. because that was just that previous to anything else happening where I met people that I wanted to write with or other people, you know, Mac McAnally wasn't around then. And now he and I are, are you know, pretty much co-writers on a lot of stuff as Will Kimbrough. And, uh, and then now I ran into Paul Brady when we were in Ireland and uh, an incredible writer. And so none of that was happening then. So you're kind of, you had your own stuff there. And I had a lot of it and, and I had enough to almost make three albums <laughs> and those wow. first three albums were the songs I went to Key West with. And I wrote a few there, but I would say 75% of them were written in the time period when I was, I was working down there and working in bars and, you know, when working on the coffee house tour, uh, you know, you'd, you'd start out like in the Carolinas or, you know, you'd go to New York and do the, do the, the bitter end or something. But, there were a couple of clubs in Florida and boy, when I got to go to Florida, you got very excited to go down there. And a lot of that written writing was done in Coconut Grove when I played there. And then by the time I got to Key West and moved in, they moved in with me. And, uh, and you know, I did, I went back and listened to that. And I went, when we were in Key West and I got on my bicycle and listened listen to the, I didn't listen to what we were doing new. I, I drove around town and listened to what we did back then. And that's where I got the idea white sport coat, and a pink crustacean was the first ABC album, and I wa I wanted to put on a sport coat and go to the Gulf, go to the Cuba side, and and that was yeah, I wore one on that album. I wore one on this album. <laughs> wow, it's I mean when you when you think about what you put out between seventy three and seventy four, it, yeah, it's crazy. If you could go back and tell that guy from you know nineteen seventy three, all the things that happened to you since, what would he make of it all? I was on a quest, you know, I think he'd be very happy that we made it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because you start out, you know, you have to commit to this. This is not a part-time job. And it's in those days, you know, the ratio of success is real minuscule. There's, you know, there's a lot of wreckage on the road to success. You know, uh, I was watching, Interestingly enough, uh, the last two days, my friend Frank Marshall, he and Alex Gibney have done a, a two-part documentary on Laurel Canyon, and I think it's oh, coming wow, out yeah. this week. And you know, I was listening to all those, you know, that group of people. I was listening to in a bar in New Orleans, trying to get to California. You know, so you know, you have to have that quest. And uh, the guy that went to Key West. What he really went there to do was get out of Nashville in the wintertime and go, because I knew from playing shows, like I said, and, and I'd had a, I'd kind of developed a pretty good uh, following in the, in the uh, coffee house circuit. So there were two places or three places in Florida that were on my route. And, and I knew that, you know, as a, as a child growing up on the Gulf Coast, I was a beach boy and I loved going back there. And then, you know, and once I got on that part of the circuit, I knew I was coming back somewhere or another. I would get to Key West and somewhere or another, I would get to California. Well, mm. California didn't work out to way later, but you know, you had to start <laughs> that quest somewhere. And then what I did in Key West got me to California. When you wrote a uh, death of an unpopular poet, were yeah. you expressing your kind of, in a way, your worst fears about your own career? I wrote it about a, a poet named Kenneth Patchen, who was a, this mm. very hip kind of beat poet back in, you know, Lord Buckley and Kenneth Patchen were like guys out of the village who were like uh, poets and, and beat comedians. And I'd, I'd worked with a couple of guys that did their material. And that's how I found them. You know, we need to go on a, 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 on that day as I was the opening act and all these other guys were like, you know, that uncle dirty was one the guy named Bob Altman. And he did a lot of, beat poetry kind of stuff. And he did Patchen and he did Lord Buckley. And that's where I picked it up. And so uh, I started reading Kenneth Patchen. I just love the fact that, yeah, the guy made it and he left his money to his dog. That's what I, that was, <laughs> that's, yeah. I, and I had a dog, I had a dog named Spooner at the time. So I put my dog in that song. But uh, the interesting thing was, what the pandemic has brought about and, and having to, having to be uh, 
shut in for a while. We started asking fans, you know, because we'd started Radio Margaritaville and Margaritaville TV a long time ago. So we've been in touch with our people on a pretty regular basis before this happened. And so I just used that, uh, that platform to ask him. I said, you know, what songs do you want me to play that I never play in the show now? And in an hour, we got 12,000 requests. <laughs> and I, I've done them. I've been, do that's what one thing I did. I'm doing videos of them that we're going to put on. And, and Death of an Unpopular Poet is number six. Nice. So I got back, I got to play them again, you know, and I haven't played these songs in a while. I mean, stupid me. But uh, it's interesting that it kind of, you know, it's kind of you're going full circle on this thing to revisit that and, and come forward from here. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happened between the time we went to Key West the first time, the time we went to Key West this time to do the record, and how where we go from here. Speaking about here and now, I mean, you obviously were supposed to be touring this summer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and now you're not. And it's the thing that a lot of people are dealing with, especially people like yourself who are creatures of the road in, in parts. So how, how are you kind of dealing with all that? I was in Florida on the way to St. Bart's for the boat race. And I got a house there. And 10 minutes before we went to the airport, they shut St. Bart's down, quarantined it. So the as everybody else has similar stories, where the hell do you go? So I had to get everybody home out here. And that's the way we got here. So, you know, and I thought, well, now what? And, you know, my kids were out here. Nobody knew what was going on. So you know, I went back to my old sailing days. You know, this is a pretty good spot out here. That we've, I've got a little trailer out in Malibu that I use as a studio and I surf out of. And I went, it's like, this is the boat we're going to say, we're going to get through this storm on. So mm -hmm. I stayed here and, uh, and have been here since. And um, I'm going to go back in a couple of weeks. But so you're here. What do you do? Um, because I had had a lot of experience in, um, in ocean voyaging. Uh, it's kind of like that. And that's what I did. I, um, you know, I compared it to when, when we used to do like, uh, we do transits from Newport down to the British Virgin Islands to go, go offshore. You, you know, you'd be on the boat for two weeks and from, from sailing like that, you do it. It's, you know, those trips usually started, there'd be a bon voyage party and people would come down to the, to the uh, boat yard and send you off. And then of course you got a little drunk and you were hung over for the first two days and you're out at sea. And that's really when some major thing on the boat would break or a storm would come and you'd be going, Oh, what am I doing out here? <laughs> you know, I, I could be back at, at the hotel eating eggs Benedict. And you kind of have to literally slap yourself in the face and go, shut the fuck up and, and, mm -hmm. and settle in. And you do. I've talked to, you know, a, a bunch of artists who are uh, possibly been on the road as long as you have. And yeah. a lot of them are concerned that they can't really go back to doing regular shows, doing big shows until there's a vaccine. I, but I don't know. Where's your head on that? I have to be a half full guy because I'm I don't listen to the politics around this. I listen to uh, having had a few uh, close scrapes of my own and depending on science as opposed to, to anything else to, to get me well. Uh, I listen to what's out there and watch uh, what's happening in the medical world and, and smart people with money. I'm banking on them because this is the moon race for this generation. And there, I've met a lot of people, luckily, traveling around who are fans that I know uh, I know we're played in a lot of uh, hospitals and in operating rooms and emergency rooms because it takes people away from, you know, I know that that's happened for a long, long time. And, but all those people are, are trying. And I just, I think they're going to have something, uh, you know, you hear it now, the Oxford thing, there's things going on, you know, there's 200 people trying to do this. And this is like us racing the Russians to the moon. You, you give that to an, to Americans with money and smarts, I'm betting on them as opposed to what's coming out of the political situation. Hmm. Think about 9-11. So anybody who's a sports fan, remember back to when you just walked in the state, you could walk in the stadium with a lawnmower and nobody would say anything, you know? <laughs> and I remember it shows people would walk in with, with blenders and cheap deep, and then the promoters would say, you can't bring this in. And we'd have to fight with the promoters going, look, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of part of the deal here. So, and then, 9-11 comes along, 
man, remember the time you first got wand or you had to take your shoes or your belt off at the airport? You go, this is an, this is an intrusion into my, 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 you know, inalienable rights here. Well, now how do you go in? If you build up, everybody cruises through and it's, I think if you see the, you know, the analogy to, to that first time having to do something to be safe, to go in to see an event, there's going to be a version of that because I think that this is, you know, and when that happens, I think it, we will go back because everybody wants to go back and, but nobody wants to, you know, and it's a stage, we're just in a stage that's, you know, fun as part of life. And, uh, but I, I'm amazed that people have been so compliant. I mean, there's some crazy ones out there, but in general, it seems like people are taking this seriously and they should. So you're picturing some kind of like temperature checks at the door kind of situation? Is that what you're, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had to go in, I had to go in for a couple of things to an in, you know, inpatient clinic. I'd bang myself up. So they're doing it now. If you go into a, a hospital or a doctor's office, you know, you're getting your temperature checked right there. You can't even really contemplate a future where you, you don't get to go in front of a big audience again. Like that's not even in your uh, head. Space even, I'm, I'm waiting for that day. And that's what I tell people. I said, you know, whenever it is and wherever it is, it's going to be a hell of a show. <laughs> and I have to think that, you know, I do. I, I totally believe that it will happen. When you sit down to write an album, you now have a whole different part of your life, which is a, a, a huge business that you, you help run uh, a very successful business. Is it an entirely different sort of part of your brain and part of your soul that you have to access to go back to writing songs or is it somehow all one thing? Cause it's not like you're the only one who's successful in, in both yeah. areas. You happen to be ex exceptionally successful, <laughs> successful in both areas, but, but I, I'm curious well, how you see that. It's interesting because, you know, yeah, sometimes I do have to ask myself, I, I go, Hey, how lucky was I to figure this out? And, and, and the way that it was, it's because, most of the business uh, that comes along with performers that go through it was always kind of, uh, you were kind of told as an artist, you don't need to worry about that stuff. You know, we'll, we'll take care of that. But that was part of the whole, you know, the way the business was run back then. It was, you know, uh, talent was a very disposable commodity in my humble opinion, you know? If you had somebody that had a drug problem, then they're going to, you would look for the younger person and them because they'd go, well, nobody tried to say go to, nobody asked anybody to go to treatment back when I remember, you know, there was not a lot of help coming from your employer of record companies. And uh, so through that whole situation, um, I was lucky enough to, when I had no job or, and, and I couldn't, play I was living in Nashville at the time this was in like the late 60s um, I had to get some kind of work and I thought okay I'm gonna be you know ironically enough there were other than downtown and Printer's Alley where it was all kind of country bars there wasn't a lot of places you could go get a job playing live music and I'd come off of Bourbon Street after two and a half years working Bourbon Street I was a good street performer I couldn't get a job and I answered an ad in the Nashville banner it said uh, uh, writer wanted journalism degree needed. I went, aha, I have one. <laughs> I answered the ad and it was billboard magazine. Right. And next thing you know, from being, you know, from being turned away from every published, this is when I was just trying to get songs written, turned away at every door and never having any success at all in Nashville. They were sending me free records and I was doing reviews and covering concerts. And I went, I like this, but I couldn't ever give anybody in a bad review because I knew what it took to get up there. So, but that period of working for Bill Williams, my editor, I learned what it really was, what the, what the music business really was and what it really was. And still to most degrees now is stacked against you as a performer, unless you take command of your own situation. So always at that point <clears throat> and the way my parents brought me up and I, you know, I worked, you know, all my, my adolescent life, I wanted to work and I was working as a, and the grocery store as a lifeguard, whatever I was, you know, I had summer job and I liked having my own money and my own independence. And I think that was a great uh, gift that my parents gave to me that I was able to do that. And they supported that. So when it came to doing it, yeah, I wanted to take care of business because when I first got in, uh, yeah, they took it all away. You know, you want a record deal, get you, 
you know, I said, well, I'd like to keep my publisher. And they went, well, you can keep your publisher, but you don't have a record deal. You know, that's what, that was it until those things changed. So going through that uh, gauntlet of figuring it out, I knew that my, you know, I wasn't that good a guitar player. I wasn't that good a singer, but I could perform well on a stage. And I knew that that was my go-to while I was trying to create these other things. I wanted to be a working musician on the stage playing. And so through that whole process, yeah, well, wait a minute. Um, why would I rent a piano, you know, at the price the promoters pay and when I could buy one and pay it off in 10 shows, you know, you start thinking, why don't I build my own bus and rent it to people and when I'm not out. So there were things that came from being, you know, brought up in a shipbuilding family. I was thinking about those kinds of things which would make, doing this performance easier and probably not cost as much. So it all started there. People say uh, John Landau, who went on to manage uh, Bruce Springsteen, that he, that he was the most uh, successful former music critic of all time, but they forget about you. That, that, that would be you, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, my big story, my, my only front page story I believe that I got at Billboard is I, I, uh, I broke the, the story of the Lester Platt and Earl Scruggs breakup. I read that, yeah. In your commencement address, I think at the University of Miami, you you, you talked about um, you talked about a moment when you uh, you had to make it through a show hungover. Yeah, and you made it through the show. You you did a fine job, but in your mind, you knew that you didn't do the best you possibly could. I'm sure the audience didn't notice anything, and that yeah. was a, a big turning point. What 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 happened there? Yeah, it scared, it scared me to death because we thought, you know, you think you're bulletproof at that age and that time and you're in rock and roll. And yeah, you know, drugs and sex, everything was around and you had done it. But you just, there was that, that, that thought process that's in there. But uh, to me, it was the, at, at that point in time, you know, I didn't want to make my family ashamed of me. And that was a very strong uh, deterrent from, from, from doing that to make that change in my life at that time. And I'd worked so hard and I didn't want to be stupid about it. And like I said, I had, I had friends, you know, who were gone along the way to that. And, you know, I was, I was watching that, that, uh, the Frank Marshall thing on, on Laurel Canyon that that's coming out. I, I, I watched the last two nights, you know, I always wanted to emulate those guys and actually they all became very good friends. But to me, it was like, Jim, Jim Mars was 27 years old when he died. Mama Cass was 32. And I'm sitting here at 73 thinking, you know, they must have been in their 60s. That was the shock to me that I forgot about how young people went away. And I just feel lucky I got through it. And I, you know, I made some kind of right decision at the right time. But again, it's too, I know, you know, I've done it and I'm not proud of it. And I know other people can do it. And they call it take the money and run shows where you may not be feeling your best. And you know that you can get away with, with something and the audience won't know it because they're so happy to be there anyway. And, and uh, I felt terrible when those things happened. I never wanted to do another one. It's interesting. I mean, you never went to, to rehab or any of that. So what did you do to kind of gain control of? Well, I, did, I went to therapy. And uh, when recovery from a, a bend became like, you know, you couldn't get back up on the first, yeah, one day fine, you can go up there and do it. And you can do the, you can do the, you can do the amazing hangover show because adrenaline kicks in. And you always were counting on adrenaline. So now we're going back like a lot of years now. <laughs> this hasn't happened in a while. But, um, but when it all of a sudden was two days and you're still feeling funky, you know, that's, that was around age 40. I thought, you know, recovering from this is taking like surgical recovery days. I don't want to do this anymore. And I just, didn't you know just did it i said you know there's and i got I scared myself a few times and that was enough to say no well, you, you were good friends with the uh, hunter s thompson and oh, yeah. he, he <laughs> obviously obviously a brilliant guy it sounds like you had some amazing time yeah, he with did, him he didn't do that <laughs> he didn't do that and, and and what's interesting in a sort of contrast to you is is one of the things that some people and and you you knew him i didn't so i don't want to put words yeah. but, but what people say about him is that he fell into a trap where he, of, of his persona and he wanted to keep proving his persona. And that was part of like his, his lifestyle and he couldn't escape that. I'm curious how that was, if you see it that way and how, and, and if that's a accurate well, <laughs> description. Yeah. You know, 
I mean, we had an amazing relationship, but there were times that I didn't want to be around him because I knew he was going there. And there are other times, you know, he was, he was an amazing kind of, you know, fun guy to be with, uh, you know, and he, he took me to the first, uh, he, he took me to meet Muhammad Ali in New Orleans after, after the, uh, uh, what was the Leon Spinks fight, you know? So Hunter had, yeah. And, and Hunter was, you know, he, he was a, he was a grown up, you know, adolescent kind of smart, incredible individual, you know, and you looked at friends he had and, and he was more political than anybody I knew at that time, but he could get into the doors and he wasn't just political to one view of himself or what his politics were, but everybody in like, there are people I know today that I see on TV and journalists and all uh, were great friends of hunters, you know, conservatives, liberals, crazy, whatever they were. He, uh, because I think in a way he, he got to be what, and got to say what they couldn't. And uh, it's kind of like maybe in the music business there, you know, there's so many people out there that want to make it in any of the sports or music or whatever, or whatever, it is that they want to do that, that they have a job that sucks, but they think ours is just, you know, like fantasy land. And it's not, it's like anything else, but you have a lot of people out there that wish they could be somebody else. And I think that that with Hunter has held on a long time. Uh, you know, he was an amazing guy. Tragedy. Yeah. I mean, I'm very sorry that he did what he did, you know, and, but, you know, you could see it coming. I hate to say that, but you can see it coming. And I didn't know whether he could stop. So I don't have the answer to why he did it, but I knew he wasn't going to do it. How did you escape the mental trap of, of ne and never being like, well, wait, I'm, I'm Jimmy Buffett. I'm supposed to represent this thing. I have this persona. But when it came time to grow up in some fashion yeah. in your forties, you did do that though, didn't you? Yeah, I had to do that. Yeah. I'm lucky I did it too. In the new song, uh, Devil I Know, which I really like, is, yeah. is, you, you, you sing about being uh, back at a bar at 3 a.m. And it, I mean, do, do you kind of still hear that call from time to time? Is it do you, a little bit of regression or, or is it fiction? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I lived through enough of those things. And, and, you know, and the devils I put in that song, you know, were, were people that my, my dear friend, my first Ricky Ben and my roommate in college, we started our first band together, Hunter, of course, and, and Phil Clark, who I wrote Power Looks at 40 about, they were devils. You know, they could have devil. I didn't, you know, I had, a, as, a, as a Jesuit Catholic trained altar boy, I had a little, that angel didn't go far. That devil was still there, but, you know, I think they had a little more of the devil than, than me. So I'd hang with them, but uh, not that long. <laughs> so that, that feels thoroughly in the past now. There's, there's no... Uh... <laughs> No, I went to Mardi Gras this year in New Orleans, and uh, no, I could I remembered what state I went to Mardi Gras in before that, and you know, and I had like, I had eight tequila, went to the parades, ate dinner, was in bed, you know, I did what I did, and I had a really good time, and didn't think, I mean, it's funny, you ask, because I, you know, I thought about that, how I'd done it before, and uh, <laughs> I was okay with it now, and I had probably had a better time, because I remembered the whole thing. <laughs> When I really listen to the song Margaritaville, uh, I've always heard the melancholy in it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's not like it's not even a subtle thing. It's it's a it's a big part of the song, but I don't know that people get that from the song, and maybe it's because of your upbeat persona or or what. But it's so fascinating that a song with that obvious melancholy in it not only became such a huge hit, but obviously the linchpin of this brand. Yeah. Of, of escapism. So how, how do you kind of reconcile that in your mind? It's always fascinated me. Well, you know, I never thought about it when I wrote it. And, and like, I started it in Austin, Texas in a, in a bar. The, uh, a friend of mine has put me on a plane to go back to Key West. And I finished it in Key West. And, uh, you know, I played it in the bar and people liked it. But I, I go back to, you know, Ry Cooter said once, you never know what the public's going to buy. You never do. And the interesting thing to your point, is that when we did the musical and we did the play, uh, when it was presented in the play by, by Chris Ashley, the director, and, and uh, Chris Yonke, the music director that I work with there, 
it, it is, they did it as a melancholy song and it goes into the verse at the end. And, you know, crowds of people that heard that song heard it that way. And, and me too, I went, man, that, you know, it's done. Yeah. There's, there's a little melancholy in here, but you got to get over it. And you, and you got, you know, I always love that part of the show because, you know, audience is like, when I'm playing it, it's like, and at this point, people are listening like they were in a theater. And then by the end of it, everybody's singing and it kind of takes its way out. But it's like, you know, uh, the theme of Mardi Gras is folly chasing death, you know. So, you know, you, know, you got to have fun to keep the devil away. So, but I love the way that they did it there. And, uh, you know, I've never done it that way, but I sure like listening to it that way. When you first heard it back in uh, 1980 that uh, that Bob Dylan had covered uh, Part Looks at 40, <laughs> what, what, was your what was your reaction to that? What do you think? You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it was 85. He did it with Joan Baez at a concert uh, somewhere out west. And I think it was an Anna Nuke or a Peace Sunday rally in 1982. 1982. And, so you know, of course, there was no social media back there. I didn't know. And somebody told me about it later. And I went, what? And then, because you couldn't see it. I mean, I knew it had happened, but I don't think I saw it happen. Was I thrilled about it? Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. And then years later, uh, I met Dylan in St. Bart's when he sailed in on his boat. And I spent a day with him on his boat. It was oh, wow. pretty amazing. Man. <laughs> and uh, he likes that song. <laughs> How can I say? <laughs> Now, did Bob Dylan know what he was doing on that on his boat, or did he have people uh, doing that for him? Yeah, did he, he knew yeah. what he was. Yeah, yeah, he was there, and uh, I, I was walking through Gustavia in the harbor, and I was I was going by the Marine Supply Store, and I was looking in the window, and and uh, I heard this voice say, "Hey, Jimmy, that's a good, nice looking pair of shoes, isn't it?" And I looked around, and went, oh, "That's Bob Dylan." <laughs> so he invited me out on the boat. We spent all day together on the boat, and then. He was seeing a, a girl that I knew on the island. Then he sailed away, and uh, and I knew his. Uh, I knew a couple of guys that worked for him on the road. And then, uh, it's the funny back into this. So I spent that day, and I mean, we sat there and talked and got stoned all day long. And I'm going, hmm. you go, <laughs> <laughs> but then later I was in Paris doing something, and I think it was when when Dylan was with Petty, and. Uh, I went to see the show and I knew Jim Callahan, the security guy. And he said, yeah, Bob's been looking for, you. he wants to see you. And I thought, all I remember <clears throat> of my time with Bob Dylan was that one day on the boat in St. Bart's. So cut to two or three years later. And I'm thinking, man, we have a bond here. <laughs> and I go backstage and I think it was the Zenith in Paris. <clears throat> and Callahan said, he's right over there. Go over there and see him. And Dylan was sitting there eating, had his gloves on. And he's going to have his hoodie on. I said, I went, Bob, how you doing? He went, huh? And he ate. He <laughs> never said a word. I sat there the whole time. I ate my meal. I said, well, have a good show. See you later. Went, huh? That was it. Mm. And I haven't seen him since. <laughs> <laughs> so, some people who have encounters like that, they theorize that maybe he wasn't wearing his glasses. Uh, and, and, that, 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 and then so that there was a lot, because, you know, he's, he's, he's funny about his glasses. So that, that could have been it. I never <laughs> thought of that. I, maybe. I'm, I'm going to use that because, yeah, he didn't look up much. I remember that. He ate That's it. And my, and my last thing about Bob Dylan is, is years later, they asked him who his favorite songwriters were. And he, he said I made you. the book. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Am I honored? You bet. It's funny. I mean, I, I think that uh, the if there's a curse to the level of success you've had, yeah. both as a, a touring artist with, with your uh, <laughs> with this uh, gigantic inflamed cult of fans and your success as a businessman, it could potentially overshadow the songwriting in some people's minds. I, I don't know if that ever if it ever, if it ever feels that way. It doesn't, but you know, it amazes me now that I go back and look at the volume of, of how much is there that I, you know, because in the beginning, you made an album a year because they wanted an album a year and you had enough stuff. And then, you know, as, as success came along, you know, and as I said, we were a touring band. It didn't matter to me because we never got on MTV. We, you know, I had two or two, maybe three things that got on top 40 radio. We weren't big hit makers but we drew we drew people and that was you know 
as somebody said once we were like uh, deadheads with credit cards you know people came out <laughs> to see us because they wanted to have a good time that's all i can figure out and what but what was good about it is every now and then you know i could slip something in and like he went to paris is one of my favorite songs i wrote yeah. it's about somebody and uh, and it, it everybody loves that song you know and it's like and i do I've done Death of an Unpopular Poor one or two times. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Don't you yeah. worry about that. But and survive. And there are songs that people do go to the ballads. And yeah, the songwriting probably gets overlooked sometimes, but I don't mind. I mean, I've had a great run of everything and I'm enjoying it. And I'm not telling people what to listen to. As like I said, once they're out the door, it's up to, you know, you make it, you make it for them. You don't make it for yourself. And, uh, and people have different tastes and, and, and different ideas about what they think are the better songs. They can have, they can have whatever they want with that. Cause I'm not going to try to make it any different. And uh, before I let you go, uh, the, the lack of concerts right now is making a lot of people kind of look back, uh, whether yeah. it's their concert going career or their performing career. And I was just curious, I mean, is, is there a singular peak experience on the stage for you or, or one or two that, that, that stick out in your mind that just would totally transcend in moments on, on, on the stage from all out of all those years? Oh yeah. I, I, I can tell you the, <clears throat> the first one that comes to mind to me, I mean, I've had some, you know, it's not the size of the crowd. I mean, I've played big places and they're, they're, yeah, of course there are times you get up there and you're playing to, to, 45,000 people and you turn around and go, can you fucking believe this? And I say to the band, but my band is, we're like that, you know, it's still, it should, it should be something that's awesome. That kind of takes your breath away. I think, you know, if you're a performer, cause you're making it happen, but they're having a good time. But the, the, the one that most sticks out in my mind is again, it was back. We were, we were basically an opening act at the time when we were doing sheds and, you know, promoters would start you in clubs and they, they, it was like minor league ball. Then you, you, if they liked you and you were drawing and they saw potential, they keep you on and eventually you can make it a headliner. So we had made it through the list and we were playing blossom music festival outside of Cleveland and uh, in Cuyahoga falls. I'll tell them that. And, uh, and so we'd done it like, probably three or four times uh, as a headliner. We draw, you know, four or 5,000 people and the place held 18,000. But promoters still kept us going. And, you know, that was our draw. And I remember, I think at one point, I think Bonnie opened for us there or the Little Feet or so. We were kind of mm. combined up with those guys. And at one, you know, I started opening for them then they would open for us. And so we were just going to work as usual <clears throat> to a show there. And we were in the cars kind of driving from the airport into the venue. And as we got close, I saw this, this guy on the side of the road that had a sign that said, need tickets. And I'm in the car and I said to the guys, the manager, hell, what does he need tickets for? There's plenty <laughs> of tickets in there. And we got there and uh, I can't remember which promoter it was at the time it came out and said, uh, you sold out. And I went, oh, what? <laughs> he said, blossom. <laughs> And it happened like that. The year before, it had been 5,000 people. That day, 18,000 people showed up. And wow. walk out on that stage to that, I will never forget that. Because everything, all the hard work and all the things that we had all done together, my band, my crew, and everybody, you know, having, having a good time and being happy where we were, hoping one day maybe we could be like the Eagles we opened for or, Fleetwood or whatever, you know, that was our goal. And then all of a sudden, when you realize that it happened, it was a great moment. It really was.